but I'm fat. <laughs> it's just true, you know? I'm not afraid of it. It's just a descriptor. Today's film, TV, and cultural conversations are making big strides in addressing a number of long-entrenched prejudices. So why do many people still act like it's okay to mock, lecture, or belittle fat people? You see fat girls, they've always got lovely hair and lovely long nails. They make an effort. Anything but jogging. Fat phobia is so normalized and pervasive in our society that we might not even see all the ways it manifests. From stereotypes like the jolly comic relief or the gluttonous villain, to thin actors in fat suits and unattainable body standards in magazines, to the thousands of one-liner fat jokes seen in every TV comedy. I think it's a fat girl's name. Might as well be Gravy Jones. Even the body positivity movement, which has entered the mainstream in recent years, too often focuses on average-sized bodies. Today, at last, some more nuanced stories are destigmatizing and centering fat characters in all their complexity, and creators like Shrill's A.D. Bryant and Lindy West are reclaiming even the word fat. By not using the word fat and treating it like there's something wrong, um, I was endorsing the idea that it's wrong to be fat, and I don't think that it is. What's your least favorite euphemism for fat? I can see them panicking, right. and I want to scream fat in their yeah. face. Yeah. Here's our take on how fat phobia took over our favorite films and TV, and how new narratives are finally breaking through to challenge it. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. On screen, fat actors have traditionally been excluded from playing complex lead roles and instead have often been featured as one-dimensional side stock roles such as the jolly fat person, the funny fat character, or the gluttonous villain, cartoonish characters who tend to be played as purely sinister or purely comedic. Early cinema brought us fat figures typically in the form of comic relief, like in the duo Laurel and Hardy. Hey! Better neck. Sorry, I don't smoke! While these portrayals aren't as overtly harmful as fat shaming, they perpetuate the disrespectful idea that fatness is inherently funny, creating an environment in which anyone who's not rail thin is prone to ridicule and resulting in very real social anxiety. It's also telling what kind of comic relief characters fat actors often are asked to play. Too frequently, their humor isn't derived from witty dialogue or wordplay. They're just fat. That's the joke. And the audience is also prodded into laughing at situations that showcase how the character is clumsy or gluttonous, reinforcing damaging stereotypes that fat people have no self-control and are fat because they're weak. And it is their own fault. Meanwhile, the fat villain and fat bastard are two related tropes that use a character's physical weight to symbolize corruption, selfishness, or abuse of power. In examples ranging from Eric Cartman to Ursula and Vernon Dursley to the fat bastard himself, outward fatness is coupled with inner evil, associating weight with some kind of moral bankruptcy. This character is often shown eating to excess, their off-putting gluttony made to feel directly linked to greed or wickedness of the soul. They're given an unrealistically obnoxious, almost impossible to sympathize with personality and made to stand in the way of a typically slim hero. You're never going back to that school. You're never gonna see those freaky friends of yours again! So where do these one-dimensional and overwhelmingly negative portrayals of fat people come from? And why are so many of us afraid of seeing even a little weight gain on the scale? I guess I didn't realize how big I was until I saw it on your faces. I've been avoiding mirrors. While historically an ample physique was actually a status symbol of the ultra-wealthy, in the modern world being fat is associated with lower-class signifiers. It's also stigmatized in our culture as a personal failing, assumed to be an indicator of junk food addiction, impulsive eating, and general laziness. Every time you turn it on, they got somebody in there talking about lose weight, get healthy, get in shape, get everybody looking all anorexic talking about that's healthy. I know what healthy is. One of the main drivers behind fat phobia is the fear of becoming sexually undesirable which stems from unattainable beauty standards Westerners have been exposed to for generations. The barrage of underweight models in advertising and the fashion industry belie the fact that plus-sized women make up almost 68% of shoppers. Another dynamic at the root of fat phobia is a judgment about health and the belief that simply being fat will always lead to 
long-term medical issues. These blood tests are going to show you the damage that you've been doing to your body, and my hope is that it will incentivize you to finally lose some of this disgusting weight you've put on. While there are legitimate health concerns surrounding a poor diet and lack of exercise, our cultural conversation has often misrepresented the relationship between health and body size as more direct than it actually is. A University of Washington study from 2010 found that obese adults can achieve good, even above-average cardiovascular health with moderate exercise. And a 2013 study concluded that there may be factors that potentially confound the relationship between weight loss and health outcomes, such as increased exercise, healthier eating, and engagement with the healthcare system. In other words, it's not the number of pounds you drop that makes you healthy, it's the moderate lifestyle changes you make while trying to drop pounds that make weight loss appear to be the cause of improved health. Even if many endorsers of fat shaming may genuinely believe their intentions are good, I don't need to do blood work to know that your overall health will be improved by losing weight. It's just a fact. Telling people that losing weight will automatically improve their quality of life is not always true and can exacerbate self-esteem and mental health problems of people with hard-to-lose genetic fatness. The utterly dominant narrative of fatness as an inherently bad thing for one's health and sex appeal led to perhaps the most popular fat character trope of the modern era, the reformed fat person who tries to beat their fatness. Though this trope was most vividly seen in reality TV shows like The Biggest Loser, a show where failure to lose weight is punished and extreme weight loss is rewarded, fictional fatness has often featured similar story arcs. In The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, when the Banks family and their doctor encourage Uncle Phil to adopt an intensive diet regime, the episode is about how difficult he finds it to cut down on fatty foods and exercise. I can't do this. I can't give up my favorite foods, cold turkey. Oh my God. Turkey. When he eventually gives in to his cravings, he has a heart attack the second he bites into a hamburger. Despite his high-stress job and hectic home life, his fatness is positioned as the sole reason for his near-death experience. I was scared. You're like Superman to me. Yeah. Cheesecake is my kryptonite. Shame around fatness dominates even in the streaming era. In This Is Us, Kate's weight loss holds her back from beginning a romantic relationship with Toby. When Toby, who is a lot more philosophical about his weight, abandons his diet, Kate ends their relationship, unable to be with someone not committed to weight loss. And it's only when Toby resumes his diet that Kate takes him back. I'm back on the diet. Not for you, for me. But also for you, so that you'll be with me. These portrayals of attempting to overcome fatness are perhaps even more insidious than the fat comic relief or villain, because they suggest that a fat character can never enjoy life or be anything but miserable until they lose weight. The same problematic assumptions are present in the formerly fat trope, a slim character who has fatness as part of their troubled backstory. That's me, six years and 600 pounds ago, before I knew how much I hated myself. These characters constantly fight off old weight gain in order to maintain their current success or happiness. Frequent references to Fat Monica and friends paint a picture of someone who is unable to understand her value, attract romantic partners, or be treated with even a modicum of respect by her peers until she became skinny. What was Monica's nickname when she was a field hockey goalie? Big Fat Goalie, correct. If we look closer, we can see how Monica's psyche is actually very damaged by being conditioned to view fatness as an innate character flaw she has to outrun. In fact, the overly controlling neurotic attitude that is her character shtick can be seen as a defense mechanism she's developed to stop Fat Monica from getting out and spoiling her career and relationships. And the fat girl inside of me really wants to go. I, I owe her this. I never let her eat. In New Girl, we see a similar dynamic play out for Schmidt, whose flashback storylines imply that when he was Fat Schmidt, he could never truly live up to his potential and was someone to be laughed at. A more positive strain of the old fat comic relief character as Hero did emerge on screen starting in the 80s and 90s. Comic legends like Chris Farley, John Goodman, Jack Black, and John Candy showed us a different side of the plus-size trope through characters who were nuanced, heartfelt, and wickedly funny, but not relying entirely on cheap, shallow fat jokes to get laughs. Once I get up on stage, start doing my thing, people worship me because I'm sexy and chubby. These characters could also break decades-old beauty standards by being shown as sexually appealing or having romantic subplots. Way to go, Tommy Callahan. <laughs> But even these mostly positive portrayals reflected a double standard in Hollywood and life, because this hero was almost always male. With a few notable exceptions like Roseanne, female characters on screen have overwhelmingly been used to reinforce the idea that being skinny is the same as being attractive. We tell 
all people, but especially women, that it's that you can only have a good life in a certain body. And in my opinion, that's political. I think it really saps women's time and women's money and women's power. And although social psychology studies have shown that people tend to overestimate the female thinness or male muscularity that the opposite sex actually desires, film and TV's inescapable and unrealistic depictions of what constitutes a normal or sexy body weight help explain why there are such high rates of body dissatisfaction and eating disorders in young women. One 90s study found that, after being introduced to Western television, the island nation of Fiji's rate of depression, anxiety, and bulimia all dramatically increased among females. In Fiji, and just like elsewhere in the South Pacific, in Polynesia, you often find that cultures traditionally value large bodies. Eating disorders were rare if non-existent wow. in Fiji prior to TV. Like extreme cases of obesity, the desire to be skinny has become an epidemic in its own right, with 30 million Americans having experienced an eating disorder in their lifetime. This has led activists to get behind the body positivity movement, with even the fashion industry attempting to redress their wrongs through inclusive advertising. So how are films and TV shows reconciling with the unbelievably fatphobic environment and set of stereotypes they help to create and perpetuate? You call yourself Fat Amy? Yeah, so twig bitches like you don't do it behind my back. The primary way fat phobia manifests in movies and TV is through characters defined by their fatness. But as the body positivity movement grows, we're seeing more characters whose fatness is simply not the focus of the story, or whose experience is dealt with in a more interesting way. In the 2018 film Dumplin', the protagonist Willow Dean is shown constantly at odds with her former pageant queen mother, Rosie. You're not eating that greasy stuff over at Harpy's, right? But unlike in a reformed fat character story arc, Dumplin makes clear that Rosie is the one who needs to accept her daughter, rather than Willow Dean needing to change her body type to become accepted. Shrill, a comedy based on the life of journalist Lindy West, richly details the full life of a fat person. To present this very, very lovable, beautiful, sexy, whole person is, I think, a little bit radical. Fat phobia is present in every realm of Annie's life. When she's speaking with her gynecologist, you should think about gastric bypass. You're at a good age for it. Out to dinner with her mother. Oh, no, no, no. No bread for us. Thank you. And reading comments about her writing on the internet. See that one that says, um, oink, oink. She's frequently treated as less than by everyone from her not-quite-boyfriend to her boss to a fitness professional who feels entitled to publicly comment on Annie's health. I was just trying to help you, you fat bitch. In its early episodes, Trill converses with the reformed fat character's story structure, as we see Annie begin to realize how fat phobia has shaped her life, giving her low self-esteem and a tendency to put up with unacceptable treatment. You're cool with going out of the back again, right? Um... Yeah. Yet Annie's solution isn't to lose weight. It's to stop accepting these biases, stand up for herself, and embrace her body. From this point on in the series, Annie's story and conception of her life becomes so much broader. Shrill also includes not just one fat character, but a cast of diverse characters. How long have you had this event? Gosh, this is uh, our third year, and it just keeps getting bigger. Wow. Well, I love this. I, I really support everything that's happening right yeah. now. Rada Blanks, the 40-year-old version, deals with fatness in a slightly different way by kind of not dealing with it. The fact that Rada Blank is a fat woman is never mentioned, and it doesn't color her interactions. She's shown to be sexually desirable, professionally successful, and respected by the young students she mentors. I've been uh, writing plays and teaching theater to teens in Harlem. Hey guys. Fishing, son. That's my teacher, yo. Patty Cakes does similar work by putting a fat protagonist into a recognizable Cinderella framework, where her happy ending isn't found in accepting her body type, but in being recognized as a talented artist. Patty and Jerry, we will be legendary. These characters' fatness fades into the background and becomes just one fairly insignificant aspect of who they are, allowing their other traits and talents to shine. Blacks be having hostable achievements, but these white producers just don't be believe in shit. Body positivity naturally aligns with movements for people of color, the queer community, and disabled people. Fat phobia is deeply rooted in complex structures like capitalism, patriarchy, and racism. 
But just like each of those movements faces its own political and cultural challenges, fatness brings with it a specific set of extremely complex challenges in our world. The emergence of Lizzo as a sexy, talented, fat black female superstar whose music centers on self-love seemed like a real watershed moment for body acceptance in popular culture. But strangely, Lizzo's status as a body positive icon has become so cemented that there was backlash when she went on a juice cleanse. Like as a big girl, people just expect if you are doing something for health, you're doing it for like a dramatic weight loss. And that is not the case. Lizzo is far from the only fat celebrity to come under fire after losing weight. Celebrities like Adele and Rebel Wilson have all faced controversy from personal decisions about their bodies. If a fat public figure attempts to change their diet or exercise habits, it's often seen as them giving into oppression or becoming part of the problem. Thus, the admirable drive to celebrate fat bodies comes into conflict with the unconditional acceptance of all bodies and underscores just how deeply fat phobia has hurt people and caused divisions in our culture. Given these tricky dynamics, figures like Lizzo have sought to draw attention to systemic issues that drive discrimination against fat people, like in the entertainment and fashion industries. Body positivity, yes, we want to end harassment and shame, but we also are working to dismantle a system that oppresses fat people. It's more productive to identify and shame the larger root causes of fat phobia rather than shaming the individual choices of fat people, whatever those may be. Movies and TV have an important role in this process. Us. Storytellers can foster empathy, prioritize three-dimensionality, and depict the real inequities fat people face in their day-to-day -day lives, so that we can all finally see the fat phobia that for so long has been all around us. As far as I'm concerned, a swimsuit body is a body with a swimsuit on it. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take.